Okay, I guess we'll start. Welcome to day two of the Art Prospect Festival in the Arts Link Assembly. I'm Susan Katz, Program Director of CC Arts Link, and I'm based in St. Petersburg, Russia. The Art Prospect Festival is taking place for the first time this year on site and online in 23 cities in 13 countries with projects by over 50 artists. We hope that you'll take a look at the projects both online and in person over the next three days. You can find the full festival program at artprospect.org. Today's discussion focuses on social practice art in 10 post-Soviet countries. Last year, we commissioned and published a major survey of the work of social practice artists in the Art Prospect Network countries, which you can download in English or Russian from the CEC Arts Link website. We're delighted the curator and theorist Victor Misiano will facilitate this conversation, looking at social practice in these countries in the light of the pandemic, political chaos, and the disturbing outbreak of regional conflicts. Um, if you have any questions during the conversation, please type your questions into the question and answer box at the bottom of the screen. Also, the conversation will be taking place in English and Russian, and you can choose which language you would like to listen to um, at the bottom of the screen. So I'll turn it over now to Victor. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Thank you for delivering me such a honorary mission to moderate this discussion. And before to write an introduction to, to the wonderful book you, you build up. And thank you for inviting such a wonderful bouquet of people with whom we have to discuss today. Welcome to everybody. Uh, so we'll switch into Russian then since uh, uh, the majority of the participants uh, of today's discussion, this discussion uh, would feel probably more natural uh, that, that uh, will react in English. But as far as I understand, uh, he'll be listening to us in Russian and participate in the, in the discussion uh, in Russian. So he, he's, he's comfortable with, with, with the language as well. Fine. We've been discussing with Susan for quite a while. How do we build up today's discussion? Um, the publication is amazing. I mean, it, it's the first book, the first publication that has put together this post-Soviet experience from, from a non-mainstream angle. Uh, I'm talking about uh, social involvement art, socially engaged art, socially engaged practices, and this is how we're going to call it today. And uh, during uh, while talking about it, we, Susan and I, we decided that the book has really happened. It describes events um, of the period and until 2018. So while the book was you know, being prepared, while the texts were written, of course, they couldn't cover the last two years, because I mean, two years for our region, especially the last couple of months, is a long period of time. A lot has happened over this, this time. Uh, both in our societies and in art, and a lot of uh, turning points. Uh, we could see a lot of turning points in the lives uh, of the people who are uh, representing this, the scene of this post-Soviet environment. It used to be called post-Soviet environment, but I guess now we don't really have uh, um, you know, the grounds to use this term, but we all understand what areas, what territories are we talking about. So we realized that we should probably discuss in our discussion, probably uh, use our latest day's experience. Um, of course, I mean, our the, the focus of our attention uh, should uh, be connected to the book, to the, to the, and we'll keep this experience of socially engaged art in mind. 
in the letter that I wrote to you uh, a couple of days ago, I sent you a letter and I, my first question, uh, the first question I suggested we should discuss today was inspired by a talk I had with Danina Steb Antonina Stebur. Anna knows her very well, and Anna has mentioned her in her text. And some of you might also know her. Uh, she's a, a wonderful uh, young poet and critic. And this talk was uh, motivated by her text uh, that is going to be published in a magazine where, where I'm, I'm an editor. And this text describes uh, an experience of socially engaged art. And she uh, mentioned that the situation in Minsk among Minsk artists who are now really engaged uh, in, in this uh, social and political process in the country, they're somehow uh, uh, at a loss. Uh, and I mean, their art, uh, they feel their art powerless facing uh, those those events. And uh, these events, uh, the element of this e events is uh, uh, larger. Uh, the inventive powers, the strategies that members of this protest create to make their protest gestures and their protest actions more are efficient uh, and the measures the tools they use are very artistic uh, very artistically expressive and the artists are the artists are lagging behind political activists and there are hundreds of thousands of political activists there i guess uh, uh, yeva has probably gone through a similar experience when uh, Yerevan was facing similar protests. And, uh, and maybe uh, the, the, the events that are happening now in Armenia with uh, uh, artists confronted by a war, a war that uh, intrudes, uh, that uh, penetrates your everyday world uh, might be a very uh, interesting experience. I'm also uh, familiar with a similar experience. Those of you who remember 1990s, the first decade after the Soviet Union collapsed, when everything was happening so fast and the reality after a very long uh, static stagnation period, uh, uh, re the reality became so performative, uh, so fast changing that the artistic world felt helpless, uh, confronted by a very artistic reality. I remember that I, I was I was editing a book uh, that is being published in English, and I I realized I was writing about exactly the same thing in the 1990s. The uh, art was feeling uh, powerless, was feeling weak, uh, facing this powerful reality. The reality was more expressive. Uh, than the art that was created or is created uh, during such periods. So I'm uh, appealing to, uh, referring to social and political experience, but I also uh, refer to socially engaged art experience. What does this experience mean? Does it mean that socially engaged art has its own limits? Maybe there are limits uh, that exceed its capabilities uh, because uh, an artist who is not socially engaged who is uh, autonomous an artist that exists who exists or who works in autonomous art uh, despite all historical obstacles this artist is able to uh, manifest something politically is able to go to the front line but as a citizen, as a person, and the art that this person is creating, it will be different, and, uh, and there, will, there won't be any conflict. And hence the question, what are we dealing here with? Are we talking about the limits, limitations of socially engaged art, or 
uh, I'm wrong. Am I wrong? This is something I want to hear from you. Maybe something you've noticed, something you've experienced. Since Minsk is, uh, Minsk made me think uh, about it. Maybe Anna could start. Good evening. Thank you very much for this uh, wonderful introduction. To be honest, it is very complex and uh, all of us, and that now I'm not only talking about uh, the art community, I'm talking about, uh, about hundreds of thousands of people. We're now facing a situation we were never prepared for. We understand that 20, for, for the last 26 years in my country, we were enduring uh, very tough conditions, but what's been going on over the past two and a half months in our country is on one hand uh, is something that makes us very happy because it, it's been for the first time uh, we can be talking about a nation being formed, a civil society being formed, uh, and there's this grassroots movement and a peaceful protest. If we're talking about the art community and what's happening in art community, uh, we, we have, we're facing this global uh, challenge on one hand. Uh, in mid-August, it, it became obvious that we need to uh, make statements, we need to reflect on what's going on together with our colleagues and artists. On the other hand, we had a very clear understanding that uh, people are not, uh, the, the place where people should be is not a white cube, is not a gallery. People should go outside into public spaces. And we've been discussing it with uh, artists, with curators, how uh, creative community, how artists and uh, uh, could be useful, not only in terms of uh, helping each other, but also uh, we shouldn't forget uh, about pandemic, which also affects what has complicated uh, our life. So we decided, while discussing it, we decided, realized we cannot uh, influence, you know, artists' uh, activities. A lot of artists, apart from being, you know, citizens, uh, they also uh, did various actionist uh, practices in the streets, but well, the limit we saw, the limit, uh, well, our limitations are, they have to do with gallery space. Uh, uh, we gave our galleries, uh, our galleries became a space of um, communal uh, creative process. People, uh, we together with our artists, we created, we made, we put put up um, a number of, uh, you know, paintings, I mean, a number of spaces to make drafts. We had a lot of people uh, joining us and the space of joint uh, experience, of joint creative experience, uh, experiencing new reality in Belarus, uh, an ex a, a space where people could exchange opinions and uh, it could have become a place of collective uh, com uh, joint meditation. But we had to, to wrap up uh, for, for other reasons. We are now talking and one of uh, the main partners of the gallery uh, uh, is now in prison and he's been in prison for a month and a half. So we, are, uh, we have entered a totally different reality and none of us uh, have been prepared for it. We never knew it. Uh, speaking of limitations and of uh, uh, and remembering the book, uh, uh, everything has really changed since the time I've been writing for the book. Uh, I remember writing how difficult it is to bring people in, to engage people, to solve some social problems, or some social challenges, or to create something together, or, you know, create local communities, uh, and we... Uh, faced a lot of challenges, uh, how to make those projects uh, open and accessible and uh, understand, understood by people. Now we are facing a unique situation 
when we have like district chats, we have districts and then groups uh, creating their own symbols, uh, holding concerts and uh, meetings. Uh, and um, I'm very happy to see uh, a situation where people are the leaders. There are no coordinators. There are no artists who would suggest an agenda or the, the, the ideas are generated uh, in a joint discussion uh, and uh, speaking of limitations, it's, it's not easy to speak about limits. Uh, over the past two months, we are living in a country with no limits, uh, whatever you make of it. Uh, and we're, you know, we don't know if, if there's a bottom to it, I mean, if we're falling down and if uh, and limits, when speaking of limits, uh, as a, you know, gallery owner and a manager and a citizen, I have to face these uh, uh, these challenges every day, so I don't know if there are any limits. Well, thank you, Anna. Listening to you, I remembered uh, the Moscow protests of 2011-2012, uh, uh, and I remember how uh, some soci very socially engaged artists uh, act uh, during those, you know, uh, huge, uh, rallies in Moscow, these artists decided not to conduct their own uh, projects, but being surrounded by those thousands of people, they started to uh, have workshops, you know, teaching people how do you make, uh, how do you work with words, how do you work with slogans, how you do you put up a slogan. Uh, so they somehow uh, decided to hand over their creative uh, force, uh, make it serve the people, make it serve the masses. Those thousands and thousands of people, they taught people how to make, uh, you know, uh, propaganda stuff. And uh, I think it's a good illustration to the issue we're talking about. You know, I've mentioned Yeva as well in my first question. Maybe Yeva could uh, share uh, her, her own uh, experiences. I'm sorry, I forgot to unmute myself. I'm very happy to see everyone, to see and hear everyone. And it's a pity that we're meeting under such circumstances. But on the other hand, we can exchange opinions and thoughts, and that could be useful. Victor mentioned 1990s. I want, we'll probably want to address that period and maybe compare. In 1990s, we also had a war. Before, we had an earthquake, and we had earthquake, perestroika, and a war that lasted four years. And when I'm comparing, and artists used to be very active. They were very active. And the first big exhibitions, uh, we had them then. And this 90s generation emerged. And I'm trying to understand and to compare. And the reason why uh, some uh, artists are at a loss is this uh, enormous information flow we are receiving through the internet. Uh, at, during the previous war, we knew there was a war going on, but it was, you know, abstract in a way. Now we know all the details. We keep watching everything. We know everything that's going on. So getting this information flow every day, uh, you cannot abstract yourself from this flow and focus on art. It's not easy during this pandemic, which also, you know, uh, came uh, suddenly, uh, this pandemic uh, gave us a choice to to create some ha some kind of space, and we could focus on uh, what we're doing. We didn't have to rush around. We didn't have to, you know, have meetings every day, conferences, exhibitions. Uh, 
uh, you suddenly had this time and it's a plus, it's a positive side of this pandemic. You can do something useful, you can read, you can research, uh, so you can, you know, do your creative work. But during a war, this is impossible because uh, you're all focused, you're all concentrated on the events that are happening. Uh, I would also like to draw an example uh, the year of Yerevan bien uh, biennial. Uh, we launched it in May, and this biennial um, was created during this break, this short break, when uh, artists got this short-term opportunity and uh, initiate a biennial. Well, Victor, you know that this idea has been discussed for years and we've tried to organize it and some institutions were also part of it, but it never came to life. It was never actually launched. But all of a sudden, during the pandemic, uh, the artists finally decided to put it together with no institutions, with no financial support. We put together this biennial and it's a collective action. It is still going on. And uh, regardless of the fact we had this online uh, regime, this online setting, we decided to uh, to launch this biennial in a in a studio in a in a gallery, and of course, I mean people uh, came. They would be careful uh, about their behavior and you know have masks and everything, but. Uh, 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 socially engaged art in our region has always been relevant. Uh, we can talk about, uh, I, I don't know if, whether we can talk about limits or not, but it always manifests itself this way or another. Uh, we're living in a very unstable uh, area and this instability on the other hand, always brings in new opportunities, introduces new opportunities. And I don't think limitation is, limitations is something we should be talking about here or whether they, where, where they start. And in your introduction, you're also uh, uh, talking about uh, these things coming into our lives. Today, we we now experience that life and art are one and the same, and I don't think uh, it's it would be easy to separate one from another. Thank you very much. Thank you, Yeva. This ideal uh, of life uh, being inseparable from art, I think it uh, uh, penetrates the avant-garde uh, period, uh, and it has always been seen as an ideal that cannot be reached. But now in the 21st century, we see this ideal being uh, realized in life, uh, and we don't even know whether we should be happy about it or whether we should be mourning it. Uh, any other ideas, or maybe uh, con you, you would like to contradict something that has been said? Anyone Меня слышно? А, а, классно. Спасибо. Спасибо, что вы нас пригласили. А я бы хотела, наверное, коротко сказать, потому что у меня тоже, видите, всегда как бы была эта проблема, что чувствуешь, что художественная деятельность слишком слаба и, в общем-то, никчемна. И есть такая довольно распространенная критика со стороны активистов, что типа, что вы занимаетесь там своей ерундой, там делают реальные вещи. А, вот. И поэтому как бы свой, вот эту слабость и искусство из своей, своей собственной позиции я всегда ощущала. И мне всегда казалось, что каким-то парадоксальным образом, даже несмотря на то, что наша деятельность может быть незаметна и не имеет никакого общественного резонанса, но ведь мы конструируем, мы, я имею в виду художницы, да, в общем, мы же конструируем новые миры, мы же, мы же работаем как бы с перекодировками реальности. Это может звучать смешно, но 
но каким-то парадоксальным образом это может в какой-то момент стать важным, и мы не можем сейчас точно оценить, насколько важна или не важна работа художников. И вчера просто была встреча с низкими с белорусскими художниками, и я задала им этот вопрос, просто мне было интересно. И вы знаете, они сказали, что они совершенно не считают, что не чувствуют себя как бы бесполезными, что ли, в данной ситуации. Они Среди ответов было, были такие пункты, например, как включенность в какие-то интернациональные сети, потому что ведь в этом искусстве оно очень интернационально, и через национальные сети можно, можно добиваться большого резонанса и большой какого-то поддержки со стороны интернационального сообщества, в том числе со стороны больших международных институций. Вот. Ну, кроме того, они много говорили о том, что как раз таки есть вот этот есть разные уровни темпоральности, есть то, что нужно делать здесь и сейчас, и протестующие как бы, как бы не артистично, как, ну какой бы похожее на искусство, что ли, не была вся эта деятельность, она все равно имеет горизонтом сегодняшние события и то, что происходит сейчас, и исходит из нужд текущего момента, в то время как есть еще темпоральности более отдаленные и менее очевидные, в которых художники могут мыслить и очерчивать какие-то новые горизонты, которые, может быть, не сегодня, но завтра будут востребованы все равно, так или иначе. Вот. И, кроме того, сама... Сама под эту постановку вопроса, что как бы, мы думаем, социально вовлеченные художники делают какие-то социальные проекты, но когда весь социум вдруг а, в, а, мобилизуется на создание какого-то суперколлективного сверхпроекта, революции или еще что-то, а кажется, что у художника отобрали его а, эту прерогативу быть лидером или автором, или инициатором этого проекта, но, на мой взгляд, это же здорово, если эта инициатива а, уходит от художника и переходит к, допустим, коллективу двора или улицы. А, и а, не нужно думать, что типа, а вот я теперь не нужна, оказывается. Нужно думать, что нет, я тоже вклю буду включаться, и мои компетенции, потому что в данной ситуации а, всеобщей мобилизации разные компетенции оказываются востребованными, и наши в какой-то момент тоже могут оказаться востребованными на улице. Вот в этом, как, например, в этом прекрасном примере, который вы, Виктор, привели по поводу транспарантов. Так что мне кажется, что это, в общем, ну вот все, Нет, больше ничего не кажется. Спасибо. It takes me further on. Maybe Tata wants to, to add something. Go ahead. I think I'm just going to continue this previous point and like just add something that I think is very important when we talk about socially engaged art or community-based art or whichever terms we use. Um, it's not a place to discuss it right now, but, and I'm not talking, of course, about like uh, in context where you, what Eva was referring to, where, you know, like it's other things become actual. But what I think is a lot of times, um, and it's in a way a paradox too, since we're talking about a lot of paradoxes and the publication too, um, is that, uh, a lot of times uh, people, the question itself, like it's formulated even like this, or the question, we're asked, so what does this change? Like the change from the artwork, from the project is expected right away, which uh, I, is not a fair thing to ask, which uh, all the things that, you know, we are addressing that we're working on uh, are of course those that bother us and we want them to change and to, to become better. But uh, I don't think that it, it is, um, uh, yeah, I, we can't really look at 
uh, what it changes right away. We need a little bit of time and we need a little bit of distance. And this is what connects to the previous point, I think, is that uh, then, you know, like we consider uh, art and artists and curators and people engaged in this kind of practices to be part of the society of doing things together. And then, you know, like, we play and we play a little role in this big mosaic of things that are happening but this kind of like expectation that the artwork is dealing with certain topic which most of the time is very problematical and complex and rooted in a lot of things to think that you know uh, what change we will see right after the project ends uh, is just yeah i think this is a not the <laughs> right perspective to look at these things mm -hmm. Спасибо, 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 Дата. Очень, очень тоже. Thank you very much, Дата. I think it was a very important point you made. Well, as I have written uh, to you in my, in my letter, I wanted to discuss another issue, an issue of a work of art. What and how could we define a work or, as we now call it, a practice, like social, like uh, social science experts do? How do we define it today? Does it recognize itself as a work of art? To what extent do we Uh, to what extent can we call a person that is performing this practice, to what extent can we call him or her an artist um, with this traditional uh, view of an artist that we, uh, we used to have? Or the, the image of an artist we had when we were trained or educated. And um, I also wanted to emphasize uh, uh, that the Minsk protests today, they don't have leaders. And it's a leaderless protest. We know certain circumstances that created the situation. But it's not only about those circumstances. Our, Art without an author. Uh, this is something we in our artistic world uh, have talked about a lot. And this socially engaged uh, uh, activist art has always been uh, manifestly promoting this art without an artist. Is, this is something that artists have witnessed in their professional experience. It was uh, a symptom to a, to a large extent. We are probably um, shifting towards a new world, a new social political situation where leadership that used to be a habitual thing uh, and this leadership has been deconstructed and is reduced. Uh, I'll be cautious in saying that it is being reduced to a minimum. And hence my question, uh, and this is something that Ruth has already mentioned, or, and Data also uh, has also prompted me to turn our discussion into this direction. What is a work of socially engaged and uh, uh, activist art? What kind of authorship are we, can we talk about? Uh, what kind of authorship uh, has emerged as a result of this practice? How could we describe this artistic subjectivity uh, that realizes itself in, the, in this, this practice? How does it refer to the traditional or even modern or contemporary uh, 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 circumstances. 
uh, how does it relate to the uh, definitive uh, categories, uh, categories definitive for uh, the artistic process. Uh, temporality has been mentioned. Uh, I'm slightly going, I'm going slightly uh, further and maybe uh, would like to, to introduce this argument that uh, brings us closer to the answer to this question. Uh, I've, I'm often asked uh, for a comment. They often ask me for a comment. I'm, I'm in media. Uh, when uh, a public opinion uh, uh, sees or witnesses uh, some very colorful actions, and they are, ask me to comment whether it is a work of art or not. Uh, however, these gestures are often deformed by someone who is not yet established in this artistic scene, in this artistic world. I'm talking about Pussy Riot, I'm talking about Pavlensky. Uh, uh, these people have uh, gained a huge media support. And in such cases, I always appeal to temporality. And I, I would normally say that, well, I, I cannot tell you right now, because this is a single uh, event that has not yet become uh, a part of an artist, artistic biography of this artistic or creative subject. I cannot tell you right now whether it is political activism, which is very artistic, or is it uh, uh, something, or is it something done by an artist? We have to wait and see what the, uh, this person does next. And we need to understand how this action uh, becomes part of an artist's biography. Then, only then, uh, this system of action that organizes uh, this person's creative being uh, gains uh, temporality, biographical temporality. And us, uh, critics, uh, art theorists, uh, uh, the artists, contemporaries or followers might talk uh, or might say whether we are dealing with an author, with an artist, whether we are dealing with a work of art uh, and uh, as piece, as, as part of the artist's biography, uh, and to what extent this very action or uh, a number of actions can be viewed as works of art. I'm giving uh, the word to, to, to you, my dear panelists, who, want to, who wants to say something. Maria, we haven't heard from you. Maybe you could, you could say something. Да, я могу сказать, немножко тоже забегая вперед, это, возможно, будет ответ на ваш четвертый вопрос, который вы в письме своем написали, о том, как мы сейчас мыслим социально вовлеченное искусство, произошли ли в нем какие-то перемены. И вот этот вопрос об авторстве, он очень интересный, потому что в Казахстане тоже есть в последнее время несколько кейсов, которые нас очень вдохновляют как кураторок и как художниц, и, как, и просто как гражданок да, своей страны. После того, как у нас сменился президент, у нас тоже было несколько таких мощных 
выступлений протестных. Вот. И был знаменитый лозунг, который звучал как «От правды не убежишь». И мне показалось, ну то есть этот лозунг был вывешен во время марафона, и как раз он имел очень большой резонанс, потому что стал символом такой казахстанской весны, казахской весны. Вот. И этот лозунг был придуман, насколько нам известно, художниками, художницами, активистками, но авторство не было как бы явлено, потому что часть людей, которые развернули этот лозунг, были арестованы. И мне кажется, здесь как бы с одной стороны художник... У него есть своя агентность, и он сам может решать, насколько это произведение как бы его, и он хочет это постулировать и, так сказать, гордиться да, чем-то таким. Вот. А с другой стороны, есть вопрос безопасности, насколько вообще как бы, ты находишься в безопасности от того, что твое произведение, как бы у него есть автор. Вот в нашем, мне кажется, в наших реалиях, ну, во всяком случае, в казахстанских, мне кажется, в Минске и в Армении все как-то немножко по-другому, но, но в казахстанских реалиях еще это авторство, оно как бы сопряжено с какой-то опасностью, которая грозит художнику как автору каких-то лозунгов, каких-то манифестов, таких манифестарных заявлений. Вот. Но, насколько мне известно, в Минске вот по-другому, и там художники сейчас организовывают... Ну, разные воркшопы и лекции, которые каким-то образом тоже вовлекают людей и объединяют. Так что, ну вот, такое у меня соображение. Спасибо. Uh, and speak about authorship. Um, yeah, uh, I think like uh, what what is uh, what is important and interesting for me here is that uh, I mean no matter what we're talking as much you know the author is not present and this kind of things it's all it, a certain framework or initiative of this kind of project. It always comes from an author, be it you know an artist, curator, a collective, a group of people, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, right? And today we see even more connection of you know people from the art scene uh, and from other spheres that want to collaborate on this. But what I think is important, and uh, I, there's been a lot of discussion already for decades maybe for uh, the character of this kind of projects and a lot of times you know this uh, uh, the a problem that has been mentioned a few times I think is uh, the openness uh, or the, the, the process-based character of this kind of works and I think like maybe like I come from the background of anthropology so I look at it maybe also a little bit differently but what what is uh, vital in this case is that uh, when you start this of course we don't know exactly what is gonna be how it's gonna continue if we knew uh, it would have been a very different <laughs> type of work and probably we wouldn't even uh, start uh, in the first place but uh it's uh, and i understand it might be connected with a lot of things such as funding or you know certain time frames that we need to follow etc but i think this openness and the possibility of you know things changing over process is very important to consider at least in broadly speaking socially engaged art practices that we're talking about because then you know like we're able we then we're able to maybe step down a little bit but like uh and that maybe that's when we disappear so to say as authors or like artists disappear or you know whoever is initiating it let's say like this but you know then i think i see this possibility of uh you know things changing if we follow the process and and it's not an easy process it's very hard and i've struggled with it myself and um but but, but i think this is important to consider that like that there is an author i mean there is a certain initiative you know where it's all coming from and to say that there is no author at all it just uh I think like we should acknowledge where it comes from but like we should be able to see where it goes and 
integrate as much as possible from the way and listen to others and change our you know perception and mind and i know again this sounds very utopian <laughs> and very uh broad and general uh but uh i think like as a, as an approach this this is more fair to do in this kind of things and then if we apply this to other things uh such as you know like uh protests and uh, artists involvement in it maybe then there is more possibilities of collaboration between if we divide activists and artists which often has been the case and then uh but again i'm speaking about when this is possible and what kind of protest we're talking about there could be very different contexts but uh, a lot of times uh there there's been like uh, and this was also mentioned before that you know like oh your artistic thing or like you are activists and then we see division even within sometimes that you know people uh working on certain topic and uh there's like always this argument that this topic is more important than this topic but it all of course depends on you know like who is speaking about this and i don't think you know like uh i think there's more possibilities of merging if we have this uh open interpretative or you know process-based approach from the beginning uh, that's what i wanted to add about the authorship note that we were discussing yes data i totally agree and i uh i do agree uh both the authorship and the work of art uh, cannot be reduced to a zero they do not disappear uh, in the process uh, certain subjects certain persons are able to to uh, let it go through them we know that a subject is relational we know that every subjectivity exists where various subjectiveness uh, subjectivenesses meet and uh, on the crossroads uh, of the actions coming from other subjects we know it from the experience of cultural theory of the of the last uh, several decades but of course we have uh, figures we have subjects we have events uh, that possess a certain uh, specific uh, referent uh, meaning and uh, another point uh, I wanted to make uh, that to a large extent uh, when we're trying to distance uh, ourselves from the idea of an over of a work of art and we use the word work uh, instead of over I mean we, we see it both in English and in other um, languages I think that it is to a large extent an attempt to distance ourselves from an official market representative institutional system of art Uh, that need mega figures created and constructed uh, or mega works uh, of art that circulate on a media uh, market sanctioning uh, this system of art, this art system. But uh, in this new dimension, uh, both authorship and the oeuvre, the work of art, does remain. And this is something uh, we, in, we exist for in this artistic world. Anna, Yeva, uh, anything uh, uh, Anna or Yeva would like to say, it would be great to hear you. Anna, I think you, you've been... <laughs> <laughs> You've been ready to say something. Uh, one of the arguments that was mentioned in the text uh, is a process of how we work. And uh, my colleagues uh, have mentioned about collaboration between activists and uh, artists and the uh, representatives of NGOs. Uh, uh, there's this demand 
necessity coming from uh, the civil society, uh, I mean, activist groups or people who pre represent various movements like people uh, who pre represent environmental movements or human rights movements, uh, addressing, they address art, artists' uh, community for a piece of advice, uh, how to make the message uh, more uh, 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 more targeted. Uh, over the past few months, we have we had meetings with our colleagues uh, from NGOs, uh, and uh, I uh, we've we've been discussing, uh, you know, the place of an artist, uh, uh, whether an artist is excluded from life, and whether. Uh, uh, the, maybe these these works of art are not that important now. And I can tell you that in our Belarus situation, uh, uh, they become even more important, I guess. And uh, I'm glad that the authorship formats are uh, now not the main issue we're discussing. Uh, I wanted to tell you, about to tell you about a, a, a cultural uh, protest or cult protest uh, a project uh, that unites uh, artists from Belarus and uh, from abroad. It's a platform, uh, and everybody wants uh, can download uh, a piece of protest art and uh, eventually become an author of this work, uh, make it into a poster and place it in some public space. And even, uh, well, the author's name on this website, it somehow goes into a shade, I mean, a shadow, it disappears. Uh, and it's very important in terms of safety. Uh, it is a challenge. Uh, and uh, like my my every day, my work day or my my weekend uh, begins with a piece of news. Uh, somebody has been detained, uh, you know, for a day or for for a week. The best uh, people in our country are now being detained, and they're spending their ten or fifteen days in prison, and it's an endless flow. It's it's it keeps going on. Uh, and uh, uh, authorship. I don't think it's a burning issue now. Many of, of us have seen this story of the three women uh, leaders of this protest mo movement. They were heads of three of the, of the ele election headquarters and uh, they were showing symbols and uh, they, they were showing three symbols, victory, heart and, and fight. So visualizing uh, comes from a Belarus, Belarusian artist who became a symbol of resistance uh, in today's Belarus. And we have many similar uh, examples. So I think that in global political and social turmoil, authorship is the last thing uh, an artist would remind everybody of. We have different values at stake. Uh, Eva, would you like to add something? Uh, our friends have mentioned the things I could have mentioned as well. Uh, the, uh, the way you asked the question, uh, it, it is as if you are asking whether whether these works of art can be part of an, an anthology or, you know, annals of art. But a lot of artists today are not really eager to have their works. Uh, of course, we have this neoliberal reality where, have, where we have career artists and curators. I'm not trying to offend anyone. Well, this is their way of life. Uh, this is something they want. They want to be part of this anthology. But there's a different reality. And uh, there are people who are not after it. 
and in in this case it becomes less important authorship becomes less important you you start thinking of creating things in a collective you become part of the society of a community you're you forget uh, that you're an artist, you're a citizen of your country and you're doing whatever you can uh, together with other people, simultaneously with other people. And uh, I think this uh, anthology issue is not relevant uh, in the situations we find ourselves in today. Yes, I understand you very well. And I understand that uh, you feel it very acutely. Maybe uh, you don't always realize it, but but this is what I have uh, noticed that when we change temporality, when we uh, both the the work of art and an artist uh, uh, become conceptualized or uh, become part of an anthology, as you have said. This is at least how I, I see it. Well, uh, another uh, story uh, that I find very important uh, in terms of the uh, this current historical period and uh, what has become important over the past few years. Uh, Maria and Ruth are now in, in Vienna. And from what Maria has said, I have understood, I think, why they're in Vienna now. I know that uh, if, if I have to give an example, uh, giving a Belarusian Biel example, Boris Sionak, Olga Sosnovskaya, an amazing uh, amazing uh, uh, defend, uh, defendants of the Minsk artistic uh, charges and uh, hearings. Uh, they're somewhere uh, next to Maria and Ruth. I'm, I'm not talking from Moscow with you either. So migration, uh, moving around is a normal thing, is a regular thing. It is one of the most obvious features of our today's neoliberal era, uh, this enhanced migration. And sometimes it has some reasons behind it that make people um, oof, uh, despite their own wish. So the circumstances make people leave uh, their habitat, they make them move to other places, and we know a lot of examples. Hence the question, how, how does it influence a situation in our countries, in our contexts, in our, how does it influence our local situation if we're focusing on socially engaged art? It is per definition uh, rooted in context. It lives from context. It uh, feeds from context. It is uh, a situational reaction to context. If you don't feel the context, you can't uh, make a precise move or a gesture because this gesture is always contextual. contextual. Otherwise, it's not efficient or effective, sorry. We know a lot of examples uh, when people were uprooted, uh, found themselves uh, in the new context. And again, uh, we, we might be talking about very talented, very experienced authors, uh, experienced activists of an art scene, but uh, finding themselves in a new context, not feeling it and acting too fast. And we know a number of artists 
who uh, came to a new context and uh, wanted to to perform some gestures uh, uh, repeating uh, their habitual uh, gestures and uh, they realized that their gestures, their moves, were not as precise as they were. This new context uh, gives a different reading. They expect a different intonation, a different formula, a different gesture from an artist. And this is where my question comes. Uh, how do we act in this situation? How do we keep this socially engaged art, art uh, effective? How do we keep in touch with the context we're no longer in? Uh, when you're forced uh, to keep a spatial distance from your context, and, and how do you uh, uh, find yourself in a new con context and whether it is needed at all? Uh, uh, that data is a cultural anthropologist and uh, he might give us a very competent uh, comment uh, i think it is a very cultural cultural anthropology uh, story a uh, case uh, and maria and ruth have uh, their personal experience uh, to to share you've met Belarus uh, artists from belarus and you know Olga Alexienka and others, uh, activists uh, from art scenes of our countries. Uh, what do you see? Uh, what are you experiencing? How do you see, how do you view uh, your career? Uh, how people from our, country, uh, our countries behave? What do they do? What actions do they take? Well, it's a huge question. Well, it's it's a it's an actual it's a, it's a question. It's a it's a question to you. Well, subjectively, I see it as a question. You know, a life question, life defining question. I could go on hours, but uh, to be brief, the first thing I think of is. In Almaty, we felt uprooted and isolated from what is going on in Kazakhstan. Masha doesn't agree, but I often felt uh, being distanced. And this is why we started to talk about Creole Center and about a, you know, a cosmopolitan perspective, uh, something I always had in my head. And uh, uh, I didn't have a feeling that I'm part of, of a nation or something, some, some local context. Uh, but my imagination or, well, always had something to do with, well, I always imagined uh, being, you know, a citizen of a world, of the world. And this is why uh, we've always said that our Creole Center is a translocal institution. Uh, uh, and we were all, always interested in this, in, in this translocality idea, how you can be a part of many places, many locations. Uh, uh, when we when we moved, uh, when you move to a different country, you face a lot of difficulties, and you've numbered them. It's not easy. Uh, uh, the number of performances we did here, they proved, uh, they did prove that we often miss the point. And uh, it might be seen as an advantage as well, uh, because the artists that are more international, that move around, they have more uh, 
uh, options to experiment with various contexts. And even if they fail, that it gives you a unique experience you can never get in your own country. Uh, and uh, in the feminist circles, uh, in the art artistic circles, um, there's a discussion about uh, what does it mean to be an international artist? Uh, what does it mean to talk about cosmopolitanism and cosmopolicy? Uh, how do we see borders between uh, national states? Uh, how how do we see local communities? How, do, how can we internationalize local communities? I see it as a utopian, but as a very topical uh, goal. How can we bring together local communities and uh, uh, networks? Uh, how can we unite them over continents and, and countries? And people who can move around, they have a privilege and they are uh, meant to experiment. Um, I will also uh, mention uh, well, uh, Alexei and Olga are now in Minsk, by the way. You mentioned them, but they're now in, Mi in Minsk. And, um, and it's a privilege that despite a uh, pandemic, they uh, felt it important to be in their own country and to help. Um, I don't feel I'm uh, uprooted or I don't feel uh, I'm, maybe we have a different uh, view of it with Ruf. We have different, uh, different understanding. And last summer when, uh, it doesn't mean we never go back. Uh, we arranged a big exhibition uh, that was uh, dedicated to art as text and an art of text. And we were uh, working with young artists, uh, uh, the artists that deny authorship, uh, the artists uh, are working uh, on this paradigm shift in a hybrid situation when an artist does not call him or herself an artist, they are activists. And uh, the, they don't make dif they don't uh, uh, see difference between socially engaged art and activism. And I think we are managing to exist between these two contexts, and in both contexts. I mean, we take part in both. Yes, if I I'm getting you right, uh, we have the, the following picture. There's always uh, an opportunity to exist between contexts. You can uh, uh, recreate yourself in a new context and go back and uh, keep contact, close contact, uh, and uh, learn uh, this new context through mistakes and failures. And uh, through failures, uh, start to understand this context better and uh, understand yourself better through your failures, uh, getting used to things you thought strange about yourself, but you're understood better. And then you can create new transterritorial network context, uh, contexts where you find yourselves, uh, where you find people uh, who in turn are themselves uh, parts of various geographical and local contexts. This is something I uh, uh, figured out from what you've been saying. Maybe first uh, three conclusions. And I recognize myself in, uh, in, in the conclusions. It has to do with my own experience as well. Maybe our cultural anthropologist would uh, somehow sum up uh, scientifically as a researcher, uh, sum up our discussion. Uh, no, 
I, I agree, obviously, that the importance of context, uh, it, it's significant. But, and the points that Maria and Ruthie made uh, earlier were uh, very important, and especially the idea of translocality when we're talking about the artist today, because uh, there's uh, a lot of cases when uh, you know, there are artists that are based in two different places, that work between two different places. And uh, what I'd like to highlight here is that uh, distancing yourself from the context for a little while at least might actually be helpful in terms of, you know, seeing it also a little bit from outside and then, you know, returning back to it. Because I think we've all experienced this, that when you are in the process, in it, and you're boiling basically inside, you know, the and there's a lot of uh, hardships accompanying this, and there's uh, a lot of issues that it's sometimes hard to, you know, like distance yourself a bit and think about it. So I think this is also a helpful strategy in this sense. And then also, um, yeah, you know, like you're based into different contexts and depending on the topics that you are dealing with as an artist or a creative person, uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it depends on, you know, like what you are involved in and then, you know, like you also become part of maybe two contexts at the same time and work in both. And what again comes as an important thing, and I'll go back to what I said a little bit earlier and what some of you also discussed is that we should not forget that, uh, you know, big part of uh, art is experimentation. So, and being part of life itself. So, you know, we live in the world where, there still are possibilities of moving in a certain way and a lot of people do this and uh you know like it, it, it's part of life so it's also part of artistic practice that how do we like how can we you know like work in this context and in this uh situation where I might be coming from one context originally but I might be based in another one temporarily for some time or just moving between those two. So I think like these kind of things shift on it. And then it brings us back to the topic of, you know, time and a little bit like distance physically in the first place and, you know, like going away from it, but also in terms of time that then we are able to actually evaluate and think about and, you know, like, uh, yeah, analyze what the work did in the context of being in two different contexts. And it was a lot of word context, but I think it's an important one here. So. Uh, thank you, Delta. Uh, I think you're very right, but I would like to, uh, to emphasize the fact that I was not asking about an artist and a context, any artist or any context, because we do uh, see a lot of types of artistic practice that it is free from context. My good friend and an outstanding uh, artist, Koka Rameshvili, lives in a very strange place in Geneva. And it's OK. The art he is making, and he uh, creates amazing art, it's free from context. He, uh, his uh, works of uh, uh, are metaphysical works and even in Geneva you can create those you can create them anywhere while socially engaged artist uh, is uh, totally immersed in the context is dissolved in the con context uh, this is uh, where this paradoxical situation comes from uh, uh, and this is why I thought it would be interesting to hear uh, Maria and Ruth experience uh, and discuss this, this issue because uh, it, it gets a, a very dramatic uh, edge to it. Yeva, Anna, as far as I can see, we don't have many questions coming. We still uh, have uh, uh, time uh, for you to share your experiences, maybe your ideas. Thank you. Yeah, Anna, yeah. Uh, Anna will be the first to speak. Uh, as for... As for ability to travel, 
and to move around in the context of Belarus art. Um, it's been only the last five years that you know, the artists uh, could, could move around. And of course, it benefits the system and it gives an opportunity to uh, get a different uh, quality of education, uh, get to know people abroad, get connections. Olga and Alexei are in Minsk now. I hope they're meeting Lyosha tomorrow. Uh, the project that you've mentioned, uh, uh, work more, uh, rest more. It's an international network. They bring their colleagues to Belarus from the post-Soviet uh, regions. On the other hand, we have a lot of artists who left the country in 1990, late 1990s, and uh, it had to do with uh, the drawbacks of the educational system. I'm talking of people who've been living in Germany, in the US, and they haven't lost their contextual connection with the country, and they're doing the job. Uh, we don't have neither time nor funds for. Andrei Dureyko or Sergei Shabohin uh, are uh, uh, creating a global archive of the history of Belarusian art. And they're uh, yeah, working as volunteers they are uh, creating archives, and uh, Olga, uh, Lyosha, and I know some other artists who are now residing abroad. I probably, uh, uh, maybe you've heard of the Highlights Belarus project, uh, which is in fact uh, collecting and presenting uh, relevant uh, news and uh, things from Belarus using uh, contemporary media. Nikolai Halesin, uh, leader of the Belarus Free Theater, who's been living, who's been forced to leave uh, to the UK, uh, is now doing an amazing uh, job uh, supporting uh, Belarus from outside. Maybe you've heard about the festival uh, two years ago, uh, uh, the festival that happened two years ago. Uh, about censorship in art field and uh, supporting all artists uh, that are being persecuted or that are being persecuted by the authorities, by the governments. And uh, if uh, someone is forced to leave the country, it does not always mean uh, they lose uh, their connection to the local context and uh, connection uh, uh, to their friends and colleagues. I think it often uh, enhances, it makes it stronger. Uh, we've been discussing with our colleagues and curators of uh, how we could arrange a big exhibition, a gallery project uh, that will uh, describe what we're living through now in Minsk. And we all agreed that some of the curators uh, should come from outside, not from the country, because it's a high risk uh, for the project to have it run by, uh, by local artists. We are talking with you today. I don't know what happens tomorrow. And uh, in our uh, situation of transition and transformation, thanks to people like Andrei Dorekin, uh, Dorek, uh, Sergei Shabohin, uh, uh, Lyosha, Olya, people who are not isolated from the context, but who know how to work with it. And it will be important that the information and the works of art that are created uh, could be uh, shown not only within the country, but also abroad. Uh, I think it's it's, a, it's rather a plus, it's, it's an advantage. All the artists that are now not staying in Belarus, not residing in Belarus, they found uh, an opportunity to come to Belarus, and it was a very serious move on their behalf, uh, especially in view of pandemic. And the last person I wanted to mention, maybe you know, Marina Naprushkina, a Belarus, a Belarus artist, uh, and she's an amazing example of how you can, I mean, she went to Germany, 
I think she left maybe uh, uh, left more than 10 years ago, and she's, she's creating socially uh, engaged art, a socially engaged projects, and she's very successful. And this is... Uh, the reason uh, for her success is her own standpoint. Uh, she herself uh, entered this new context. She was a newcomer, and most of the projects she's been working with, she's working with refugees. She's uh, focusing on social issues, and uh, this forced uh, change of context, of voluntary uh, change of context, can bring more uh, new things and uh, to the to the place where the, the artist comes from. Uh, while Anna was talking, we had a question. We had a question, and uh, I've been uh, sent this question, and the question is more or less the following. What makes a protest uh, experience of protest, not only artistic experience, not only uh, art protest, uh, but uh, social protest? What does make it, what does, what is there about this protest that makes it unique? what makes it different from other protests in other countries. Uh, while listening to Anna uh, and your references to Marina Niproshkina and other artists and other um, Belarus artists that live outside the country, uh, I drew a conclusion that the fact, what, 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 uh, this the, the context of a global scene. Uh, Yeva would remember we discussed it in the 90s. And in the 90s, uh, we thought that they were totally juxtaposed, local and uh, the local and the global. This is at least how I see it. Uh, the 90s were the, the first decade of globalization. And it was structured uh, uh, as in, in the in the market way. Uh, we had this huge uh, Western supermarket that displayed local identities or national identities, and uh, representatives of our countries were uh, representatives of our ethnicity, of our locality. On one hand, it gave us an opportunity to manifest ourselves. Like we would say, you're, you're lacking this locality, look at us. On the other hand, we felt uh, humiliated. We felt uh, reduced to uh, being representatives of locality. We were not seen as intellectuals, as artists after this, uh, uh, period, uh, activist uh, political age that uh, uh, was added to art in the beginning of the 21st century, it has changed the way uh, the intellectual, the artistic world is structured today. Uh, Niprushkina and other artists with their and intellectuals with their experience uh, of confronting social injustice, uh, their experience of uh, uh, reaction, uh, uh, philosophical reaction to the imperfection of the world. Uh, when they come to a new place, they find the same imperfection and overcoming this imperfection helps an artist or give an artist an opportunity to find a place for themselves in a different geographical and social context and justify 
the interest towards this artist in this new context, uh, an interest towards them being people who had to confront injustice, had to confront some new experience. So you have this new environment and the experience of experience of a productive contact uh, between people coming from very different contexts. Uh, people who come from the socially engaged art experiences. And uh, in my opinion, uh, the, what makes our uh, what, what makes the context of our experience, post-Soviet uh, context experience unique. I, and I keep saying that I don't know whether we can still use this post-Soviet term. Uh, I think uh, this, uh, this issue, this uh, problem is somehow, uh, somehow disappears. So this market, market-like approach, uh, is no longer there. We are looking uh, at uh, at the experiences of fighting injustice, fighting uh, the powers to be, and uh, I. This is what I deduct from what you're saying, or it's a it's a kind of a summary. Maybe you have your own answers. What makes uh, our protest experience is unique. I mean, protests in our countries. What what makes it unique? Maybe I'll give a brief answer. Uh, what makes my experience, my own experience, unique uh, right here and now? It's a peaceful character, peaceful way of uh, manifesting uh, your civil uh, standpoint of manifesting your civil stand uh, on one hand uh, the, the authorities are trying to marginalize the protesters uh, and uh, this inexplicable violence that can be paired well compared to genocide but at the same time uh, well uh, Belarusian people are unique people you've seen those those images of uh, protesters uh, that would take off their shoes to stand on on the benches not to uh, well and and they would uh, they would bring plastic bags and collect rubbish after after their protests. I'm not a radical at all. Six, seven years ago, I was in Kiev uh, during the Ukrainian events. Well, before it, it, it got really violent, but I can tell you that uh, this is what makes it unique for me, that despite all the threats, all the repressions, it's been two and two and a half months, long time for any protest, but the, uh, the protest is not becoming radical. People protest in a peaceful manner. People go out into the street to express their opinion, to defend their civil, civil rights. And what also makes it unique is uh, that one of the slogan uh, is is a, is a line from a song by a Russian group Spleen. We haven't known each other before this summer. Everything that is happening in our in our country uh, is amazing. I mean, thanks to the latest elections, we've we've come to know our neighbors. We started to help each other. We began to get to know each other. It's a unique story. Uh, a, six months ago, or in April, uh, uh, there was an interview about the national idea and about what can about uh, the future of Belarus. 
I kept saying that uh, our society is so uh, isolated, uh, is so uh, fragmented. It's a huge contrast to what I'm seeing today in the streets. And we all know that this uh, Soviet experience or uh, experience of a Soviet, our Soviet past, uh, it's not about collective action, but today the situation is changing. We're not alienated anymore. I would add there is another feature of Minsk protest uh, that makes it unique. I don't know whether it has to do with the Soviet heritage or inheritance rather, uh, whether it, it's a separate case, whether it has to do with what we've inherited from the Soviet Union, but it has to do with the transformation of the global world as such. And the feature I'm, of the new world uh, I'm, has never been so vividly manifested in this global world, even in the uh, leading spots of this world, Minsk protest has a female face. It's a female protest. We are living in a totally different world. And uh, this is where I would like to wrap up and say that this is something that makes our future uh, very promising, very optimistic. And uh, this is this, uh, and, and this is where I, I think we should end uh, our today's discussion. And I think it could be a case for our second volume of publications, <laughs> or second second volume. Don't you think so, I think Susan? I completely agree. This has been a really interesting conversation, and I want to thank Victor for moderating the conversation and. Anna, Dada, Yeva, Maria, and Ruthie for sharing what's going on in your lives right now. This is a fascinating conversation and um, I hope we will be able to continue it and we definitely will continue working with all of you. Um, I hope everyone will also continue to attend these meetings. We're having a number of very interesting conversations over the next month as part of the ArtsLink Assembly. So please take a look. And right now I'm gonna share a screen which has information about the publication. Um, a miracle or misunderstanding so that if you're interested in downloading it, you can. Um, thank you everyone very much for attending this and um, I hope for a, a better 2021. Bye.